Okay, so with this presentation, we're going to go over some of the basics of modern taxonomy. The other day I introduced some of the history of classification, the history of taxonomy, but let's look at what, what we've learned over the past couple hundred years since taxonomy was created. So if you recall, taxonomy was created by Carolus Linnaeus, and what taxonomy is, just to refresh our memory, it's the it's the branch of biology where life is grouped, life is classified according to their shared traits. And during the time of Linnaeus, he really only had physical features to depend upon. He would look at the physical features of various animals, the physical features of various plants, and not just him, but other scientists of his time, and they classified life according to their features. And so then, during the time of Linnaeus, dolphins and sharks were both classified as fished. When you, when you look at them, they look very physically similar. Well, nowadays we have more information. Nowadays we know that mammals, uh, that dolphins are mammals, and that fish, and that sharks are fish. Mammals, the dolphins, mammals have lungs, and sharks, which are fish, have gills, and that's not the only difference, but uh, there's many, we've learned that there's, uh, there's a lot more ways to interpret classification besides just physical features. And so how is life classified today? Well, we still do use physical features and we have a fancy vocabulary word for studying the physical features and studying the form and studying the structure and, and that's the word morphology. So yes, we still do examine the morphology, examine the physical traits, the structure of organisms. We also can uh, get, gather information from the fossil record. The fossil on the right is, I believe, a bat, and the fossil on the left is a spider. And you'll see the spider fossil again a little bit later. We also classify life today, and this has been some of the biggest breakthroughs. This area right here is, has led to some of the biggest breakthroughs in our understanding of taxonomies. We use biochemistry to classify life. We use uh, comparing DNA and RNA and amino acids and chromosomes and proteins. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And we also study, uh, we also can use uh, the study of embryology, the study of embryos, to see how embryos develop to kind of give us a sense of how to group life according to their shared traits. But the big thing I want to mention is that no longer are we solely dependent on the physical traits to classify life. So when we look at the area known as morphology, examining the form, examining the structure of organisms today is still very important, as was it during the time of Linnaeus. Well, one of the things that we can look at is we can examine homologous structures. Now this diagram is something that we saw during the evolution chapter, but if you recall what homologous structures are. They are body parts that have a similar structure, yet a different function. So you look at the four limbs of the, of the human, the cat, the whale, and the bat. They all provide a different function. A bat's function of its forelimb is for flight. A whale's function is for swimming. Cat for walking. Human kind of have a multi-purpose arm for grasping. But they're built very similar to one another. Our form the, the human form and the human structure is very similar to a cat, very similar to a whale, very similar to a bat. And so what have we learned over the years? Well, we've learned that if organisms have a similar structure, if organisms have a similar form, if organisms have a similar morphology, then they're closely related. When you look at these three pictures here, you may not think that whales, bats, and elephants have very much in common. But when you examine their morphology, you can actually see that we have a lot, uh, that, that these three animals have a lot in common with one another. For instance, their, their morphology shows that they all have, all three of these whales, bats, elephants, have body hair. All three of these give live birth to young. They don't lay eggs, they give live birth. All three of these are warm-blooded, so they rely on their, uh, they are able to produce their own body heat, and they're able to maintain their own body temperature. All three of these species right here, the whale, the bat, 
the, and the elephant, they all produce milk, the females produce milk to feed their young. So due to the similar morphology of these three animals, all of them are classified as mammals. There was a time where these animals probably would have been looked at very differently. I mean, whales look like very big fish. And, and so at a, there was a time when we, uh, when, when we were still early in our understanding of morphology where we probably would have classified, as, classified these three species as something very different. But today, because we learn more and we know how to study the form and the structure much, in much more detail, we see that they have a lot in common. But we also look at the fossil record to help determine how to classify life. Remember what the fossil record is, it's the collection of known fossils. And when we study fossils, we can see similarities and we can see differences when we compare those fossils to creatures that are still living today. Here we have a, a, a tarantula, or a spider fossil on the left. I'm not sure if the fossil is of a tarantula. But we have a fossil of a spider on the left, and we have a tarantula on the right. So when we compare fossils to creatures that are still living today, you can see similarities, you can see differences. Of course, there is a problem when it comes to the fossil record. The fossil record is often incomplete. Here's a picture of the fossil called Lucy, a very famous, well-known early human ancestor fossil. Well, you notice how there's many bones that are missing. So it's very rare to discover a full, complete skeleton. And also, it, it's just hard to find fossils. Some organisms don't fossilize well. Soft body parts don't leave fossils. So it's hard to find fossils of maybe jellyfish or something that's a very soft organism. Also, just uh, keep in mind that when organisms die, not oft, uh, very often their dead remains are fed upon by scavenging animals. And so when an animal dies, a leg might get uh, ripped off the dead carcass and dragged somewhere else. An arm might get ripped off and dragged away somewhere else. So finding fossils intact are very hard. Fossils can be disturbed by earthquakes. The remains that are found might be incomplete. So uh, there are gaps in the fossil record, but with more time, we are finding ways to fill more of these gaps. And so what have we learned by studying the fossil record? Well, we learned today, uh, we've learned that life today is related to life from ages ago. Humans were in a category of organisms called primates, and that goes back millions of years to uh, you can see in the diagram to other primates that we have relationships with. And we'll talk more about um, we'll talk more about about ways in which we can uh, use this information to build upon our knowledge of classification. One of the biggest areas of biology that has helped us better understand classification and taxonomy is biochemistry. In biochemistry, what we're learning to do is we're learning to compare the DNA, chromosomes, RNA, amino acids, proteins. We're learning to compare the chemistry on, of living organisms. And we're learning to see how we can uh, determine who's more closely related based on our DNA, our amino acids, our chromosomes. So similarities and difference can be found. We can look at the similarities of human DNA and chimpanzee DNA, for example, and we can identify differences. We've seen this table earlier in the school year. If you recall, this table compares the differences between human cytochrome C to nine other species. Cytochrome C is a protein, and like all proteins, it's made from a collection of amino acids, starting at the bottom. Human and yeast cytochrome C has 42 differences. As we move our way up, human and wheat germ cytochrome C has 37 differences. Human and fruit fly cytochrome C has 24. Human and bullfrog, we have 20 differences. Human and a pigeon, 12 differences in our cytochrome C to theirs. Humans and a cow, 10 differences. Humans and a rabbit, nine differences. Humans and a rhesus monkey, one difference. And then finally, humans and a chimpanzee, when we compare our cytochrome C to chimpanzee cytochrome C, they're identical. 
So when you look at this information, it's a very strong conclusion that humans and chimpanzees are very closely related. We have very similar biochemistry, and you can see it in the amino acid sequence of this particular protein. One thing we've also learned by studying biochemistry is that DNA mutates, DNA changes. Every time organisms reproduce, when cells are copied, every now and then accidents are created. We call these accidents mutations. And as time passes, as, there's more, as more time passes, there's more opportunity for DNA mutations to occur. So watch this picture here. Here we have a common ancestor and there's a small piece of DNA. 25 million years later, you might have two separate species and their DNA has little differences. And as time as time goes by, as another 25 million years go by, so 50 million years total, we now have more differences. So DNA mutates at a, uh, at a known rate, and when we look at the DNA, we can kind of have a good estimate. When did, when did two organisms have a common ancestor? If we compare how different their DNA is, we can kind of have a, a pretty good uh, estimate for when they had a common ancestor. And so what have we learned? We've learned organisms with similar DNA have a more recent ancestor. In this table, it shows the amino acids that make up only a very small portion of the hemoglobin protein. Hemoglobin is a protein, and like other proteins, made from a collection of amino acids. And when you look at this table, you can see that the human and the chimpanzee portion of this pro uh, hemoglobin protein are, are, are identical. They're, they're the same. So when we look at biochemistry, we can get an idea of which organisms have similarities, which organisms have a more recent ancestor. Okay, so check out these four pictures. We have a human represented by Brad Pitt. We have an orangutan, we have a gorilla, and a pygmy chimpanzee, and a couple pygmy chimpanzees. Well, what we've also been able to examine and this relates to biochemistry, we've been able to examine the chromosomes of all four. Watch this picture. This picture shows from left to right a human chromosome on far left matched next to an orangutan and then the next one a gorilla and then the next one a pygmy chimpanzee. And so when you pick a chromosome number, any chromosome number, look at chromosome 20, Roman numeral 20, two X's on the bottom there. When you look at chromosome 20, the chromosome on the left is hum a human chromosome 20. The next one over is an orangutan number 20. The next one over is a gorilla number 20. The next one over, a pygmy chimpanzee number 20. And when you line up chromosomes like this, you really do get a nice comparison of how similar we are on the biochemistry level with orangutans and gorillas and chimps. Not only do we have the same number, we also have the same um, size and the same color banding. And, and I want to make a little amendment to what I just said about the same chromosome number. That, that's not entirely true. Humans, we have 46 chromosomes, and uh, the great apes have 48. And if, you, uh, if, if you've ever studied why that is, we, we think that two early, uh, sometime in our past, two of our chromosomes became fused together, making uh, humans have 46 chromosomes, and other members of the great ape uh, having 48 chromosomes. So I do want to make that distinction there. So another area where we, you, where we gather information to help classify life is in an area called embryology. And in embryology, like the name implies, ology means the study of, and embryo is the study of how Embryology is the study of how embryos develop. Well, here's a picture of an embryo, very early in development, very small, very early in development. So early in development, there's a, a small group of cells known as a blastula, and, and this forms, again, very early in development. Well, notice at the bottom of the picture, there's a small little indentation. There's a small little opening. We call that small little opening, we call that a blastopore. You know, the word pore, like you think of pores in your skin or tiny little openings in your skin. So that small opening right there is called a blastopore. 
And what we can do is we can study how do different embryos of different species develop. What's kind of funny and interesting at the same time is the blastopore will develop into the mouth of some animals and develop, develop into the anus of others. So comparing, well, whose blastopore turns into a mouth and whose blastopore turns into an anus, we can kind of see who's related to one another. And so that little opening right there will be the mouth of some animals and the anus of others. And what we've learned is that if organisms develop along a similar path, that's a pretty strong indication that they have a relationship. Well, what about humans? What does our blastopore turn into? Does it turn into an anus or does it turn into a mouth? I know you've been dying to know the answer to that question. Here we go, another picture of Brad Pitt. Are starfish more related to humans on the right or insects like the cockroach on the left? Well, one thing that we've learned by studying the embryos of insects, by studying the embryos of starfish, and by studying the embryos of humans, one thing we've learned is that humans and starfish are most likely uh, have, mo have a more recent ancestor. We have more in common. We have a, a, a closer connection. And the reason we think this is because, well, one of the reasons we think this is because the blastopore of a human and the blastopore of a starfish forms the anus, but the blastopore of a insect forms the mouth. Organisms whose mouth form from the blastopore are called protostomes, and organisms whose anus develops from the blastopore, blastopore are called deuterostomes. Uh, just uh, it's just kind of a silly, comical way to show how we can study embryo development to determine who might be related to one another. And so this brings us to to this new this 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 area of taxonomy known as phylogeny. And phylogeny is where we study the evolutionary history of a species. And the picture right here is a tool that we call a cladogram. And a cladogram is used to show the order in which we think a species evolved from their ancestors. So for instance, in this picture, we think a hagfish evolved first, and then a perch, and a salamander, then a lizard, then a pigeon, then a mouse, then a chimp. And we're going to go over how to read these cladograms. But when we when, uh, when we start to discuss these cladograms and how to read them, one thing I want to mention is, well, we use the evidence from all those topics we just discussed to build a cladogram. We use evidence from morphology, from biochemistry, from fossils, from embryology. We use evidence from all these areas to try to trace the evolutionary history of a species. Well, let's go over cladograms and show you how to build them and how to read them. So before we get into a biology example, let's kind of do a silly one. Here's a list of six cities from around the world. When you're building a cladogram, start with a very broad trait that all the organisms have in common. So for instance, here's six cities from all over the world. One very broad trait that they all have in common is they're all cities of Earth. Again, very broad. Well, then we're going to start to look for uh, some some pretty broad differences that might apply to some but not others. And I'm going to make a little bracket here and I when I look at these six cities I notice a pretty obvious pretty major difference a fairly broad difference between a couple cities versus the rest. So again I'm going to try to think of a, 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 some, a, a characteristics that, that's a little less broad than they're all cities of the earth. And when I look at these six cities one thing I notice, a very, uh, uh, it's still very broad, but not as broad as a city of the earth, is I notice that a couple of these cities are in the eastern hemisphere and a couple are on the west, er, and four of them are on the western hemisphere. So just to make following these easier, I'm going to label the four that are in the western hemisphere and the two that are in the eastern hemisphere. So let's follow the branch of the western hemisphere, Rio de Janeiro. Dallas, Quebec, and Las Vegas. So you look at those four cities right there. I'm going to make another bracket, another branch. And when I look at those four cities, Rio, Dallas, Quebec, and Las Vegas, one city stands out from the other three. 
I, again, I'm going to try to come up with a, a characteristic that's a little less broad than being in the Western Hemisphere. And I think a very good example in this situation would be the fact that one of these cities is, uh, is in South America and three of them are in North America. The three North American ones are Dallas, Quebec, and Las Vegas. One city by itself is in South America and that's Rio de Janeiro. So now that Rio de Janeiro has has reached its end branch, let's focus our attention to North America, Dallas, Quebec, and Las Vegas. So of those three cities, I'm going to have to make another branch, and then of those three cities, I'm going to try to think of a less broad, something a little more specific. And when I look at those three cities, I can see one, one of those cities is very different than the other two. One of those cities is in Canada, and two of them are in the United States. So the two in the United States, Dallas and Las Vegas, the one in Canada has reached an end branch, and that's Quebec. Well, now we have to look at Dallas and Las Vegas. So now I'm going to have another branch, and I'm going to come up with a very specific, something very specific to Dallas, something very specific to Las Vegas. Well, let's look at the state in which these cities are located. Dallas is in Texas, and Las Vegas is in Nevada. Well, let's go back to the bottom of the, of the cladogram here, the Eastern Hemisphere. We have Paris and Rome. So just like the, the top half of the diagram, I'm going to make another branch, and I'm going to try to come up with a, a, a specific, something specific to Paris, something specific to Rome. So let's just look at the countries where these cities are found. France is where you find Paris, and Italy is where you find Rome. So when you look at this cladogram, we've created this, this diagram where we've outlined some of the features of these six cities. Well, let's try to read it now. So here's a quick question. I, I took away all the other cities. I, wanted, I only want you to focus on Dallas and Quebec. According to this diagram, what does Dallas and Quebec have in common? Pause the video if you want some time to think about it. I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So when we look at the answers, start at the far left, and what, we're, what I'm doing here is I'm tracing and showing you the path that Dallas and Quebec follow before they split. Dallas and Quebec are Earth cities, they're in the Western Hemisphere, and they're both in North America, but that's the three that they have in common. Once you get to North America, they split. Quebec is on the Canada branch, Dallas is on the USA branch. So that's kind of just a silly example of a cladogram. Let's look at a biology example. So again, here's the notes that we were taking, and here's that same biology example. Looking at this cladogram, if I were to ask you to list the characteristics of a salamander. So I'm hoping if you can pause the video, you can answer this yourself. I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So starting at the bottom, if I were to list the characteristics of a salamander, I'd start with the jaws and then I'd go up to the next branch which would be the lungs and that's it because the salamanders stop. The salamander branch goes to the left and the lizard, the pigeon, the mouse, and the chimpanzee move to the right. So those are the only two traits right there listed in this diagram of a salamander. Same cladogram but here's a different question. What does a mouse and what does a lizard have in common according to this cladogram? Pause the video if you want some time to think about it. I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So they have jaws in common, they have lungs in common, but then they, uh, and, and excuse me, and they have claws and or nails in common. But then they split. The lizard splits and goes one direction. The mouse splits and goes another direction. So everything before the split they share in common. Okay, so here's another cladogram, and if we were in class, I would give you guys a minute to discuss this with your neighbor. But here's a couple questions, and pause the video and try to answer these two questions. I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So question number one, what does an amphibian and a crocodile have in common? Well, so we'll start at the bottom, and what we notice is that they each have vertebrae, they each have a bony skeleton, they each have four limbs. 
but that's really going to be it because they then split and branch and go separate directions. The amphibian branches to the left, the crocodile branches to the right. So everything before the split they possess in common. Well, what about number two? List the traits of a ray-finned fish. Start at the bottom. The ray-finned fish has vertebrae, it has a bony skeleton, and then the ray-finned fish splits from the rest of the animals, from the amphibians, the primates, the rabbit, ro uh, rodents, the crocodiles, the dinosaurs, and birds. So everything before the split, uh, the ray-finned fish possesses. Everything after, it does not. So here is a similar cladogram to what you just saw. It's just a different format. You're going to often see cladograms in two different formats. Let me put them side by side one another. So here, this picture shows both types, both styles of cladograms. Even though they look different, they're exactly the same. These are the same cladograms, just two different formats. So what does an amphibian and a rabbit have in common? Pause the video. I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So starting at the bottom, an amphibian and a vertebrate in each cladogram have vertebrae in common. In each cladogram they have a bony skeleton. In each cladogram they have four limbs. But that's where they split. The amphibian breaks away. You can see it in the top diagram. And the amphibian breaks away. You can see it in the bottom diagram. Going back to the top diagram, you can see that the rabbit breaks away to the, uh, f to the opposite direction. And now look in the bottom diagram, you can see that the rabbit again breaks away to the opposite, di uh, opposite direction. So everything prior to that breaking apart, they have in common. Vertebrae, bony skin, and four limbs. So here's a just an example of a very complex cladogram. Now when you look over these traits, unless you study unless you study these anemones, these corals, you don't you're you're not really probably even going to know what some of this information is. And, and and I don't know what all of this means. And but that doesn't really matter. You don't really need to know what calcitic sclerites are. If you know how to read a cladogram, you can answer this question right here. How many of these eight species have calcitic sclerites? You don't have to know what calcitic sclerites are to be able to read this. Pause the video, try to figure out how many of those eight have calcitic sclerites, and I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So here's the answer. Of those eight, the, the seven that I just labeled have calcitic sclerites because you can see that branch labeled calcitic sclerites. Everything before Everything before that calcitic uh, sclerite branch does not have calcitic sclerites. But everything attached afterwards does, and you can see those seven are attached. Try this one. Of those eight species, how many of them have a common, oh, I don't want to say this wrong, coenchyme? Pause the video, I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So of those eight, I hope you identified those five right there. Everything before that characteristic, they don't have. So there are three animals before that characteristic of a common coenochyme. I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I apologize. But everything after the appearance of that trait, you can see that there are five organisms that appear connected to that common coenochyme branch. One more example. Okay, so here's the last example. How many of these eight species have eight fully developed mesenteries? You don't need to know what a fully developed mesentery is. But pause the video, I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. So of those eight, I hope you can see that those two have eight fully developed mesenteries. You see the appearance of the trait, it's labeled on that branch. Well, everything after the appearance of eight fully developed mesenteries will have a trait.
and you can see these two appear after the appearance of that characteristic. So we've reached the end. Go ahead and pause the video and, and try to answer some of this, these questions, perhaps on a separate sheet of paper, and I'd be happy to check your answers before class or after school one day. So go ahead and pause the video and try to work these out. Good luck.